My name is Tom Dine, and uh, in 1971, I was legislative assistant to U.S. Senator Frank Church, a Democrat from Idaho. I had joined his staff after coming back from two years of foreign service at the American Embassy in New Delhi, India. So I was, and I had, and I had graduate studies in South Asian history. So when the awful events of March 25th occurred in 1971, I was ready for this intellectually. Nobody's ready for this emotionally, but I was, I knew where Dhaka was, I knew where Chittagong was, I knew where, uh, that the Bengalis were in Western Bengal and Eastern Pakistan. It came to my attention on the 26th of March, the killings in Dhaka, uh, those, those were reported. And immediately I said to myself, this is the culmination of the Freedom March of the Awami League. This would be the culmination of the deep, deep tensions between West and East Pakistan. This would be the end to Jinnah's dream. And also, I knew about the superiority complex of the West Pakistanis toward the East. And I said, this was, there was nothing but bad going to come out of this. So uh, I made a decision that uh, in, the, in the context of the Washington political system, that we could play a role. I also knew of Nixon's past, of his feeling of closeness toward Pakistan. When he was a lawyer, uh, after he lost the presidency to John Kennedy in 1960, and then didn't become governor of California, he joined a law firm in New York, and one of his accounts was Pepsi-Cola. He used to travel around the world. He always visited Pakistan. <clears throat> I was in the American embassy in New Delhi in the late 60s, and he came through, and the Indians didn't want to pay any attention to him. So we've had, uh, traditionally, in American politics, at least up until recent times, the Republicans liking the Pakistanis and the Democrats liking the Indians. Secondly, so the first of all was Nixon's inclination toward Pakistan. Secondly was uh, Nixon's inclination for strongman rule. He liked authoritarians. <clears throat> and, in, uh, and with Kissinger as his foreign policy advisor, they were of the what we call the realism school. Power for power's sake, forget about human rights, forget about democracy, forget about developing individual uh, uh, strengths. Uh, so Nixon Kissinger pursued the war in Vietnam. He invaded Cambodia to expand the war. They sided against a duly elected government in Chile, Allende, and brought in Pinochet, the strong man ruler from the, from the army, and then this occurred. And Yahya Khan fit right into that mold. So I just knew instinctively this was going to be a very tough road to hoe in the United States, and the policy would be wrong. AMA Muhith, economic counselor in the Pakistan Embassy in Washington. I had came to me, he met me, because Senator Frank Church put into the congressional record, went to the floor of the Senate, gave a speech, and then put into the record all the document, documentation that I could find to give him about what was taking place. The, the, the denial of a free and fair election, the denial of self-determination, and uh, the d denial of human, human rights and human life. And Church put into the record, I think it was 54 pages, and this meant that a strong statement had come out of the Senate of the United States against what we did not call then, but was the tilt toward Pakistan. 
April 30, 1970, Nixon expanded the war and sent American forces into Cambodia. And Senator Church, and among others, was, were totally against our involvement in, over, and around Indochina. So when this occurred, this, would be, this was going to be another example of the, the imperial presidency, in presidential determination of what American foreign policy would be without consultation of the, of the Senate and the House of Representatives. And we were totally uh, driven by this constitutional desire that the Senate had an equal role in the formulation of policy. We were going to oppose this. We were going to take our stand. And this was going to be another deadlock between the two branches of government. Classic constitutional government. Deadlock and opposition uh, and offering of alternatives. And so the war uh, in Bangladesh and the, and the tilt toward Pakistan because of Nixon's inclinations, and then later on we found out about the Kissinger's trip to China. All that was in that constitutional context. And that's what makes this even a bigger issue. It made it a bigger issue for myself and a bigger issue for Senator Church and his colleagues. I had enough experience legislatively uh, in opposing uh, the American role in Vietnam. You have to stop the arms. Uh, so I went over and over again in my mind. And I asked Muheath many questions about the Pakistani military, Pakistani need for American arms, how we could prevent it, including it eventually led, particularly these doctors, these American doctors who were at the cholera laboratory here in Dhaka, um, there was an American ship that was going to get arms loaded onto it. And we, we had consultations with the maritime unions. We uh, aroused public opinion in and around Baltimore. And we stopped lo the, the arms getting onto that ship. Well, I'm sure there were other ships elsewhere that were getting arms. But every time we could cause a break in this uh, passive acceptance of, a, of Nixon Kissinger's policy toward Raul Pindi, we, we could score a victory. And that's, that's very important. When it's the small versus the big, when it's David versus Goliath, or as Thucydides wrote, has written, and we all accept it as gospel, big nations use might, little nations have to use their brain. And uh, that's what we did, day after day, doing this, doing that, uh, to, to uh, get our point of view across. Senator William Saxby of Ohio, a Republican of Ohio, my counterpart, my, his legislative assistant, who was a Columbus, Ohio lawyer, and I had had experience in writing anti-Vietnam, anti-Cambodia, anti-Laos legislation. So I knew how to do, I knew what to say, and, and together we crafted this amendment, which would stop American military assistance to Pakistan. I believe in passing legislation, particularly when it comes to foreign affairs, where there's no natural constituency. You must develop a groundswell of grassroots support. You must offer expertise in Washington. And together, the, the countryside, the grassroots, and Washington come together. It's, it's like uh, the military term, the pincer movement. And they most, most the grassroots and the Washington experts must be saying the same thing. So that required coordination. That required information. That required connectivity between citizens, state after state, with their senators. So that's what was going on in this process, developing enough knowledge and enough confidence to take on the White House. And then finally, constitutionally, particularly in the Cold War, the President of the United States was seen as the supreme leader. Now, we Americans, supposedly very democratic and egalitarian, submitted 
to whoever was president because of the nuclear age, because the Soviet Union, and, and because a growing disbelief in the U.S. Senate that goes back to World War I, that they were not good enough to lead the country. So we were overcoming the opposition of history and the defeat of, 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 of the League of Nations under Wilson. We were uh, going against the inclination of Republicans to give Nixon whatever he wanted. We were going against the trend of the imperial presidency. And we were also um, irritating a lot of people because uh, I, remember, I remember some of the senators saying to me, it, it doesn't matter, it's not a big deal. And we had to make it a big deal. It had a psychological effect, it had a political effect, but not a legal effect until it was you know, over. But again, it was a symbolic victory. And symbols in politics are just as important as substance. You know, the uh, perspective is as important as reality. Remember, we were up against the realist school of thought inside the White House. We're not the Westminster model where the executive and the parliaments are blur. We're separate powers, and those separate powers were clashing. And I can only tell you, as an American citizen, deeply ingrained in American history and thought. Nothing is more exciting than that struggle over the direction of American foreign policy. This is our first trip. We were, we were going to come, we were going to meet uh, uh, Sheikh Mujib and all the things, but we, we never got around to it, if you will. So this is a long time coming. But what it has done is to rebond us with the people of Bangladesh, with your, the leadership of Bangladesh, and the memories of times past and what those memories mean to, to everyone. It's the, the pain of 1971 is still alive and hurting here in Bangladesh. And I can feel that. I can feel it on the streets, I can feel it in conversations, and I could feel it from your government leaders when they gave their speeches at the award ceremony. This is an open wound that time perhaps is taking care of, but you need more time. And that's why it's so emotional.